Greetings, Earthlings. <laughs> I come in peace. Live long and prosper. Actually, when I got here, this is my first trip to uh, Manchester and Salford, and uh, it's great to be here, by the way, but when I actually got here and I got off the airplane, I said, take me to your leaders, and they brought me right here. So that's all very good. So the idea of a TED Talk was relatively new to me. I understood that you had about 18 minutes to talk about something that had to do with technology, entertainment, and design, and that we wanted to look for an idea that was worth spreading. So don't worry, though. Mine is not rocket science. But I do want to ask you by applause, how many have been to see the movie Gravity? Oh, OK. Uh, by applause, how many intend to see the movie Gravity? Okay. Oh, you make me feel a lot better now. Thank you. So uh, based on the results of my little survey then, I want to share my thoughts. My idea we're sharing is something that, uh, let's watch for just a second, see if this works. Ah, oh, very good. Explorer's been hit. Explorer, do you read? Explorer, over. Explorer. Astronaut is off structure. Dr. Stone is off structure. What do I do? Dr. Stone's detached. No. You must detach. If you don't detach that arm, it's going to carry you too far. Listen to my voice. You need to focus. I'm losing visual of you. In a few seconds, I won't be able to track you. You need to detach. I can't see you anymore. Do it now. Ooh, holy cow. <laughs> That's what you call a bad day in space. <laughs> a very bad day in space. Oh, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> ah, there we go. So there you go. That's the movie Gravity. I hope you'll all go and see it. And I have uh, 15 and a half minutes to go. So what I want to talk to you about is the force of gravity. And by the force of gravity, I mean the fact that this is entertainment. This is exciting stuff, and I think we can use it to our benefit. As we said before, this is Sandra Bullock having a very bad day in space. Now, I lived in space for 151 days, 18 hours, 23 minutes, and 14 seconds. I don't think I ever had a bad day in space. Every day was a good day in space, even when you include the day, five days after I arrived in orbit, when we hooked up a new solar array to the International Space Station, we went outside on a spacewalk, we plugged in all the cables, and we unfurled the solar array, and it started to generate electricity, which promptly killed all six computers in the Russian segment of the International Space Station. <laughs> Ooh, that was a bad day, but I wasn't scared. And it was a bad day like the day Oleg and Fyodor and I were horsing around on a Friday afternoon on the space station, and we learned that our KU band radar had failed. Ooh, that sounds serious too. But actually, it's not a big deal, except for the fact that we weren't going to have email for the entire weekend. That is a big deal. And then finally, the only other really bad day I had in space was the day the toilet broke. <laughs> yeah, I remember that day well. I'm in the lab module on the U.S. part of the space station, and Oleg comes floating down, and in his Russian, he says, Clay, asu nie robotit, which means, Clay, the toilet is broken. Right after that, he looked at me, and he said, Clay, nie jest, don't eat. <laughs> Ooh. Now that could have been a really bad day in space. As a matter of fact, if we go back and we check out Sandra Bullock, Oh, i got to go backwards here. There you go. If you check out Sandra Bullock, the only thing I'm certain of in that picture, besides the fact that it was done in Hollywood, is that she's probably, if she were wearing a diaper, she's probably soiled it. <laughs> so that's the real deal right there. That's me on a spacewalk, right? You notice that there's no shrapnel in the picture. There's no crisis going on. 
And that's because a lot of people take a lot of time to make sure that we're safe. And you see the grandeur of the International Space Station and two astronauts, myself and Rick Mastracchio, who, by the way, just launched yesterday to go to the International Space Station. We're outside, and you see the beauty and the size and the magnitude of all that is there that was recreated so beautifully by the folks in Hollywood. Okay? So now, we talked about shrapnel in space, about debris in orbit. And I got to create my own orbital debris. Let's watch this video. Is it going? Yep. There's sound with this. Patient Genesis. Put your And it's got a uh, positive pitch. About uh, 360 degrees in uh, five seconds. And it's, it's just got a little bit of right roll. Nice job. Uh, nice job, Clay. We're 15. No. Clay, sorry to interrupt. We're 15, 10 seconds away from a five-minute LOS. Great job. We'll talk to you on the other side. So I created, so I created my own space. Go ahead to the next one. So Sandra Bullock and Spanx is worth at least three and a half out of five stars. Okay? <laughs> but as we said before, the movie isn't quite as realistic as, as some of us might like it to be. It's very entertaining. I would tell every one of you to go see it. I would say pay the extra money for the uh, 3D glasses. But remember that when you go into that movie, it's all about entertainment. It's about excitement. It's about getting people excited about what we do in space. Now, she wore underwear. So did I. It just so happened that I chose to wear my underwear on the top of my head. And of course, what was interesting was when I actually floated up in front of the camera that was live for NASA TV in Houston, Texas, at 10:01 uh, in the morning that I put the boxer shorts on my head, and I waved to the ground, and uh, immediately I found out later that they cut the feed to all of NASA TV, so you got beep and just colored bars, because NASA didn't want me to show me wearing my underwear on my head. <laughs> but we know that the movie is a little incorrect in. The, in in areas such as the debris kind of flows the wrong way. When you look at Sandra Bullock, her hair doesn't do the zero-G thing. Uh, the fact that you can't go to the Hubble Space Telescope and the International Space Station and the Chinese Space Station all in the same orbit, we don't care about any of that. This is all about entertainment and how people tell the human side of spaceflight. So, how did I become an actor who got the opportunity to wear a real spacesuit? in outer space. It was 1968, on Dece Christmas Eve, when my brother and sister and I were awakened by our parents, placed on the floor in front of a black and white TV. Do y'all you, you remember what a black and white TV is? <laughs> Old people in the room tell the young people about black and white TVs. <laughs> so here we are watching the Apollo 8 astronauts go behind the backside of the moon for the very first time in the history of the world. Right? They're talking to the control center, everything's going well, until they go behind that big, gray rock in the sky, at which point all you get is <laughs> nothing but static for almost 15 minutes. Well, I'm an eight-year-old kid. I'm very impressionable. I have a very vivid imagination. I'm thinking, holy cow, a volcano on the backside of the moon. It's erupted and blown them out of the sky. Or maybe a Mars dragon has flown in and blown its fiery breath across the capsule and burned them to a crisp. I didn't know. Until 15 minutes later, they came around on the other side of the moon. You hear the Quindar tone that's famous in NASA TV. Beep. And they started to talk to Houston again. At that point, I was hooked. But my mother would tell you, as you see in the picture there, I was hooked when I was six years old. In my hometown in Ashland, Nebraska, a very small town, very country town, we had a weekend event in July. And that weekend event was called the Stir Up, to stir up trouble, to stir up excitement. And we had a kitty parade where all the kids dressed in costumes, but we couldn't go to Costco. We had no way to go to Target and buy Spider-Man and Iron Man and Wonder Woman. So my mother, very resourceful, she wrapped me up in aluminum foil. 
So that's actually me, dressed as a Mercury Gemini astronaut. She took a hat box from her closet. She cut the eyes in, put the little dingle on the top so I could communicate, communicate with the aliens. And I walked as a Mercury Gemini astronaut in the kiddie parade in the stirrup in Ashland, Nebraska. And I got second place. Yeah, she was really chapped. She didn't like that at all. She thought I should have won. But you know, if you look at all this, and the fact that it took me 15 times, 15 applications, over 15 years to become a United States astronaut. And then we can go and we can see what Hollywood does to create that vision for people like you, for people all around the world, for kids just like me who dream of doing exactly what I did. And then I got to see the beauty of our planet. A glacier in the Alps, the Bahamas near Eleuthera Island, here we go, anytime, ah, the Palm Resorts of Dubai, where you all are vacationing this uh, winter, I'm sure, a harbor in Italy, and the rugged hills and mountains of Pakistan. So these are actors and actresses who are given the opportunity to put on a costume, to learn their lines, to go into a studio where brilliant people with computer software technology and and cabling and mechanical systems and people just like you who can do all of these wonderful technical things, can take a dream and turn it into something that we at NASA can use, right? We can use this technology, we can use this Hollywood activity as a platform for all the people in the world, the young people especially, because while these people are actors, we also have real astronauts. People with lives, people with families, people with responsibilities. And we need to take that fantasy, attach it to reality, and help people figure out how to dream, how to do things that maybe they think they can't do. And I like Sandra Bullock a lot better than I like George Clooney, by the way. And I don't think he'd be three and a half stars in Spanx. Although some of the women might disagree. So NASA is known worldwide. But it's only an American institution, and we need to make it bigger than that. We need to make everybody in the world responsible for how we can take what we do today and make it accessible to all of you. And one of those ways to do it is with science, Technology, engineering, and a new one, art, and math. So what we know in America as STEM is now starting to become STEAM, where we can take the things that happen in the world of arts and science, technology, engineering, and math, and we can combine those together so that we can use this, NASA can use this, as a stepping stone to getting kids fired up about the future. I think all of you will one day have an opportunity to live and work in space. And that's my dream, that you and I, all of us, have the power to change a life. It doesn't have to be big. It can be very simple things. You can do it in your school. You can do it in your church. You can do it at your place of business, where you work. But the idea here is to understand that in the world of entertainment and something as well done as a movie like Gravity, we can use that to our advantage, to excite people and give them the opportunity to dream just like I did when I was that eight-year-old kid wrapped in tinfoil. So, you know, I don't ever understand why everybody laughs when they see this picture. (laughs) 
One of the basic questions that I get asked a lot as an astronaut, right after they ask me how you poop and pee in space, is what was it like to be in space? And my answer is simple. I was Superman every day. I flew to breakfast. I flew to work. I flew to the bathroom. And I even flew while I was going to the bathroom. I was faster than a speeding bullet, traveling 17,500 miles per hour, five miles every second. I was more powerful than a locomotive with two fingers. I could lift something that weighed hundreds of pounds. I was able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, flying around the earth at 220 miles above the earth. And I stood for truth, justice, in the American way, or at least I hope I did. So my challenge to you, my idea worth spreading, is simple. It's to take what you have, use your mind, use your imagination, and try to turn our young people to things like science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. We need more supermen, and we need more superwomen. And I challenge all of you to help me spread the word and do exactly that. Thanks a lot, Salford TEDx. It's been a pleasure.